Hey folks, Quillikeen here, and I get requests all the time to do a Hearts of Iron 4 tutorial. So here it is. You go to single player, then you go and click on tutorial. Wait, you've already done that? that? That's not enough for you? But it's a really good tutorial. You should probably just do the tutorial. All right, fine. Okay, new game. We're going to start a new game. We're going to start in 1936 because that way you actually get to play the game as opposed to just, you know, play, play some sort of predefined scenario. That's not very fun. We're going to play as Germany. Why are we going to play as Germany? Because Germany, despite the fact that you would think is the most important thing in the universe, is actually pretty simple to play compared to a lot of the possible other options. For example, everyone else has got colonies all over the damn place, and that's no fun to play at all. The most of a colony that Germany has is this little bit over here. It's separated by only a couple provinces. Much easier than have to deal with, like, I don't know, India or something like that. Who wants to deal with that? It's so far away from home. So you're playing as Germany. Now, excellent, wonderful. What are you going to do? Well, you've got all these little icons over here. Just click on one of them and then do things. So the first one is research slot available. Research sounds pretty important. You can click on that and you get a whole bunch of things to research. Notice that there are tabs up here. Go through all of them. Look at your different options decide what you want to do and when you decide scratch that idea go to industry grab basic machine tools then you're gonna go and you're gonna go industry and you're gonna grab construction and then you're gonna go to the next one and you're gonna go engineering and you're gonna go electronic mechanical engineering excellent and then you're gonna go back and now you finally get to pick something why do you care about these two tabs because these things let you build things faster and let you research things faster they are the most important thing in the game if you are not ahead of time you want to research this what do you mean by ahead of time well you see how everything's got years over here if it is 1936 and you're trying to research something that's only supposed to be researched in 1940 you're gonna to have to pay a giant ahead of time penalty you almost 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 never want to do that so just don't then you can look at the other tabs and decide what you want to do. And basically, most of your warfare is going to be, there's going to be a lot of in this, uh, infantry. Infantry is the most important. Then you got support battalions that make all your infantry better. Well, this is the most important. Then you've got armor. That's tanks. Hey, tanks are pretty good. This is the most important. Then you've got artillery. Artillery does huge damage for the, for the amount of investment you've got to put into it. Artillery is the most important. Then you've got doctrines. Doctrines don't sound very sexy. They don't give you more unit types, but they make everything you do better. Therefore, doctrines are the most important. Then you've got your Navy, and well, if you're Germany, it's probably not that important, except for submarines. Submarines are awesome as Germany. If you're not playing as Germany, if you're playing as like the UK, well, then you want all the things because otherwise you're just going to lose. Turns out that boats are pretty important for stopping Germans from invading your territory. You've got naval doctrines as well. Oh my god, doctrines. Doctrines are most important. Then you've got air power. Turns out in World War II, air power might be the single most important thing. Excellent. Then you've got air doctrines, which make all your airplanes better. And then we're back to engineering and industry. What do you want to research? Just, just pick something. Just go with something that feels okay. As long as you're making things better, you're not going to fail. There are a few things in here that are more specialized. You've got these special forces. They're very good, but if you're not going to use Marines to do naval invasions or paratroopers to drop on paratroopers on people, or if you're not specifically got some sort of weird plan for the mountains, you might be able to ignore these because they are more specialized. They're very good, but for the novice, maybe just grab something that makes all your normal stuff better. For example, these infantry weapons. Now, I'm not going to improve my infantry weapons here because this is a 1938 tech, but maybe the support weapons over here. What do all these numbers mean? Who cares? They make things better. Yeah, you can min-max certain strategies, but all in all, this means that all your infantry will fight better. Plus other things. Okay, well, infantry is a pretty important part. Those are your dudes that run around on the ground. Infantry is pretty important. Armor, well, as Germany... Your armor, your tanks are pretty goddamn important to your strategy, uh, but you're already all done researching as Germany, which is fantastic. Until 1939, you really have no reason to research the armor stuff. Artillery, well, okay, artillery is incredibly important, and grabbing this art interwar artillery will make your support, well, all your artillery, 10% stronger, basically. What is soft attack? Soft attack is when you kill squishy things, like human beings, as opposed to heart attacks, which is when you try to kill tanks. Most of the people that are going to be fighting in a war are going to be squishy human beings, therefore soft attack, pretty damn good. What do you research first? I'm not going to suggest anything specific, except maybe go ahead and grab the doctrines. Doctrines are very slow to research. They improve all of your combat really, really, really well. It's not a bad idea for your mobile, your land doctrine to be focused on it. There are four different categories. Some nations like Germany already start with one in there. You can switch to a different one, but it will go and cancel the one you got for free. Your Germany, just go and be mobile doc warfare doctrine. Why? Because you can get the Blitzkrieg, which sounds pretty damn German to me. Excellent. We're done on research. What are you going to do next? You got another icon over here. Civilian factories. Civilian factories. What do they do? Well, civilian factories build everything except the actual guns that fight your war. But that includes the factories. The civilian factories 
build factories that make the guns right over here, military factories. The more civilian factories you have, the faster you build everything, except the actual guns right at the end of the thing. Civilian factories are incredibly important, and early on in the game, you're gonna to wanna to focus probably on their construction. How do you do that? Well, you see this button over here that says civilian factory, click on that, and then it shows you a breakdown of all the land you have broken down by state, in addition to their capacity. Hanover, for example, can have up to eight buildings. It's currently got five. Well, why don't we go ahead and click on Hanover and queue up one civilian factory. Then let's just click on a few other places and get some more civilian factories put in. Awesome! At some point you are going to want to focus on military factories and at some point you might want to do a whole bunch of other things, but for now, civilian's pretty good. What's next? Free military factories. So, civilian factories build everything except your actual guns. Military factory, build your guns. You can see here there's already a queue set up for Germany. You've got Infantry equipment, which is the equipment for your infantry. And if you can't figure that out, maybe you need an even better tutorial than this one. Support equipment, it, it supports all your other things. Artillery, but okay, so you got a bunch of things being produced here. How do you use them? Let's ignore the screen for a moment, and instead let's go over to this recruit and deploy button over here, the tank with the little arrow. Incidentally, this is also the thing that will open if you look at the confused men over here with the red exclamation mark that says no divisions in basic training. This recruit and deployment button is where you start training actual troops, but there's an interesting dichotomy in Hearts of Iron that you may not find in other games, in that your troops, turns out they need guns and tanks and vehicles and support equipment before they can be deployed. Hearts of Iron is a division level game. Every single thing you see on the map that is a unit over here, for example, this lovely looking infantry in Wilhelmshaven? That doesn't sound that German. I don't know, who am I to judge? Anyway, I guess Wilhelm is pretty Germany. Anyway, this guy here, this is a division of infantry. You can tell because they have a lovely little helmet as opposed to this division of tanks, which looks like a goddamn tank. And this division of mobile infantry, which is, listen, you're not gonna have to worry about the motorized infantry too much. Anyway, recruit and deployment. You can train some troops. For example, if you want more infantry, you can click on the train button over here. Now you could click on this button more than once to train more than one division, but that would be stupid. Instead, what you're gonna do is you're gonna just train one set of infantry over here, and then you can add more units to this one line because it somehow looks less stupid than this. Yeah, is there a difference? Technically sorta, but you're basically just going to use this particular version. So this is how many units you're gonna train simultaneously. All of these units need equipment, which is what this area is over here. And if you mouse over it, you can see that we don't have enough equipment right here. We have all the manpower we need. Those are the manpower. Those are the human bodies that you're gonna be sending to their death in this stupid, stupid war over here. Uh, but we don't have enough infantry equipment. You see that line, infantry equipment. We only have 52 of 910 available. Support equipment, we only currently have one of 30. And artillery, we only have one of 24. If we look at the next line, it's even worse. We have zero because the first line gets all the things first. So clearly we need more infantry equipment, support equipment, and artillery. Luckily, those things are already being produced, but we do have the extra military factories over here. So we know that we need more. And in fact, now that we've queued up some units to build, do you see where it says total need, total need, total need, and total need, and actually a few more over here? Because we are trying to train a certain number of troops, not to mention we already have a certain number of troops who need reinforcements, this will now tell you how much stuff you need of everything. Clearly we need a lot of infantry equipment, 8,000 guns. By the end of the war, you're gonna have to build hundreds of thousands and use them, trust me. So you clearly need more of kind of all the things, which is a pattern that's not going to stop. These are infantry equipment one. Eventually this will become obsolete and will get replaced with equipment, infantry equipment two. You can actually see that from the research button over here. If we're clicking on any one of these researches, it doesn't matter. We're not gonna change the research. We're just gonna take a peek. If we go to the infantry tab over here, you can see that in 1939, we can research weapons two. So in, we're gonna be using weapons one for at least the next three years, probably at which points we'll start researching weapons too, but how long is it gonna to take to research? Some amount of time. Right now it says 8.45, but that's because there's a huge ahead of time penalty. But probably by 1940, you will have switched over your entire production line over here from infantry equipment one to infantry equipment two. But that's okay. In the meantime, you still, turns out, you need some guns. So 
we have how many factories? We have 40 in total, 20 are currently being used, so we can assign the other 20. Well, let's go ahead and fill out this line over here so that we get more infantry equipment going on. Um, and potentially we need to get going on more support equipment. Support equipment, you don't need a whole lot right now, but actually later on you will need a lot as you switch into some support companies. Toad artillery, same thing. We're gonna make really good use of these toad artillery later on. We're gonna see how that works. Light tanks too, holy cow. 720. Well, it doesn't seem like that much until you realize that you're only making four of these per week as opposed to 78 per day with this infantry equipment. Well, we're Germany. We like tanks. Let's go and put a lot of those. And hey, how come things turn gray over here? Well, you're out of factories. You're using 40 of 40 factories. This is letting you know that if you were to build or acquire more factories, they would get automatically assigned over here. But right now you don't have them. There's another thing that happened. You notice a number here got in red. Well, that's because you need oil and steel to build light tanks. Now, in Hearts of Iron 4, you don't need oil to run your vehicles. You only need them to build them. You can think of it as in terms of you're stockpiling this oil for future use, even though it sort of kind of doesn't make any sense. But basically, um, running out of oil at some point later on does not cripple your existing units. It just means you can't really build anymore. These tanks will still get built. They will just build slower. That's what happens if you don't have everything you need. Then we get down the list and there's even more stuff that are looking to get built, but we can't really queue more up. I mean, I guess we could. We could do this, but we don't really have the factories for it. But hey, turns out fighter planes are going to be pretty damn important for you, um, as are, well, kind of all the things. Next icon, free dockyards over here. If we click on this, we end up with exactly the same screen as before. That's because your ships are built at dockyards. They do not use your factories. They're entirely different class of factories. We have 10 of them in total. We're currently using nine. And as Germany, you start off, you're already building submarines, destroyers, and heavy cruisers. In fact, you've got eight in the queue over here. If you go and change this number, you can bring it down to one. If you hit minus one more time, it actually changes to infinity, at which point it will just never stop building those submarines. Uh, and I hear submarines are okay. I don't know. We'll leave some in the queue. It's fine. Let's just go ahead and say that we want some more of these dockyards and that will function. Excellent. What's the next icon? National focus. Whoa, this brings up a big giant thing. What is a national focus? Well, if we close this window and you actually click on your little German Reich symbol over here, you can see your current political view and you can see here there isn't even that button for select a national focus, which brings you to the same screen. Every country has a set of national focuses. They're sort of like another technology tree or something of that nature. Now, only the big major countries um, have a unique focus tree, like Germany, for example, or Poland, because everyone knows that Poland is super duper important and lasted a really long time in World War II. Most of the countries actually have a generic set of uh, focuses available to themselves, but they're actually pretty good. But Germany's got a unique one, and that's fantastic. There's a lot of them. What do you pick? Well, you pick one of the gray ones, first of all, because those are the ones that you can pick. Everything that is sort of still brownish, you can't reach right now. They have a prerequisite. Usually, it's just a prerequisite of one of the previous things up the tree, which you can see by the lines. But sometimes they have slightly more prerequisites. For example, you can't Anschluss until you have at least 550,000 manpower in divisions in the field. What does that mean? Build more dudes. Wait, what does Anschluss mean? Something, something Austria. It doesn't matter. You'll figure it out. Just push some buttons and things will happen. As Germany, you probably want to go and grab something from the left-hand side. Why? Because this first one builds infrastructure. And infrastructure actually isn't important at all right now. But if you go down the tree, you get here, you get more factories. And then here you get more factories. And factories, turns out, are pretty important. Are factories the most important thing in the game? No, the most important thing in the game is probably research. And if you look, you go down here, you get more research slots. So, hey, let's go ahead and start down the left-hand side. I will say this, though. Rhineland? Remidilitarize that stuff. It's pretty good too, and it leads you to a lot of decisions that help you get um, automatic, justified war claims. But we'll come back to that a little bit later. Reich Autos Bond. We're going to go and grab that. Hit start. Good. Hey, we only have one button left. What is this? Insufficient resources. This button is probably going to be here the entirety of the game, and that's okay. Again, if you're low on a resource, you will build things slower. It's not that you don't build things, it's just that you build things slower. So ideally, you would like to have all the resources you can. And at the start of the game, it's actually relatively easy to do that. For example, we are missing 22 oil, which we can see over here. Our country produces four oil, um, it exports one for some reason, and we need 22 more. What do we do about that? Well, if you click on this little tab here, if you click on any of these, it changes the list down at the bottom. What this shows you is the countries that are available to export a certain resource. For example, the United States have 966 in total and they're ready to export about 950 of them. Turns out that there's a lot of oil in the US. Anyway, if we want to go and import some of the United States oil, we can click on United States over here and we can 
ask them to send us a certain amount. You get eight per civilian factory. What do you mean civilian factory? Well, civilian factories represent all kinds of different production, including, I don't know, fancy fancy mugs that are, are sold for souvenirs. Well, what you're doing is you're basically trading the output of, in this case, three factories in exchange for 24 oil that is gonna come at you consistently. You don't stockpile, there's no storage for oil or anything like that. It's it just whether you have it or you don't have it. Um, and it's an eight to one ratio. Now we only need 22, this will give us 24, which means we're wasting a little bit of it, but it might still be okay to hit this button. That being said, if we trade away three civilian factories, then that means we have fewer civilian factories building more civilian factories. Early on in the game, the most important thing you can do is probably just build more stuff with your civilian factories, and in particular, building more civilian factories. So you may not actually want to go and complete that trade. Now, when it comes time to really up the ante on your military production, then it's probably going to become a lot more important for you to get your trade sorted so that you can produce more units. But I will leave that up to you, because what do I know, really? So we're going to ignore this for now. That's going to be fine. And now, uh, what do we do? I guess we could unpause the game. Have we checked all the buttons to make sure that everything is happy? Well, the German Reich's got a bunch of stuff going on right here under the flag icon, which by the way, might not be obvious, but this is a button and you can do a lot of things with it, including change a lot of your laws, hire some advisors and so on and so forth. To do any of this, what you really need is political power. As Germany, you get 1.5 per day because it turns out Hitler is awesome. I, I mean, wow, no, no, he's very, very bad, but he does generate a lot of political power and that is pretty strong. Turns out in, in, in the time of World War II, this dude, pretty influential, whether we want him to be or not. So what we have to do is we have to save up some of this point so that we can make some of these decisions. For example, under political advisor, if we click here, we can see we can hire different people. They've got all kinds of different stuff going on for different things. For example, captain of industry, ooh, we can build factories 10% faster. That sounds pretty good. Uh, what else we got? The war industrialist is from military factories. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Uh, Rudolf Hess over here can give us even more political power, which I guess is fine. Um, so there's a lot of good options. Under conscription, we can get more manpower. We don't know what manpower is yet, but it sounds like it's gonna be something pretty important. It doesn't actually matter right now. You don't need dudes right now. You got 1.2 million, you don't have to worry about it. But later on, when these guys start to die, maybe you'll want more manpower. What else we got? Exports, uh, it has to do with trade. Let's ignore trade for now, it's gonna be fine. This button though, real important. Mobilization laws, this is our economy laws. Right now we're partial mobilization. It would be very nice if we could increase our mobilization so that we can focus our economy on making more guns. What's the deal here? This basically has to do with how militaristic your, your economy and your people are thinking. If we were to switch up to say a war economy, we would need fewer consumer factories dedicated to making goods. Right now, we need 20% of our factories, 20% of our factories just get consumed to build consumer goods like toasters. So we have 32. 15 of them are wasted. And you're gonna say, wait a minute, I'm not great at math, but I'm pretty sure that 15 is not 20% of 32. That's right. But if we take a look at our production screen over here and take a look at our military factories, you realize we have 40 military factories over here. And that's what's going on with the math. We have 72 factories in total and 20% of that is 15. And therefore we lose 15 civilian factories to making toasters. If we were to change our law for our mobilization here to something else, for example, war economy, we would only need 15% of our factories making toasters or total mobilization, we'd only need 10%. Not only that, but if you go and improve your mobilization even more, you get to produce things faster. Your military factories, for example, here are get built 30% faster. Ignore that uh, mili civilian to military and back and forth conversion. You'll never do one of those conversions. Most likely it's not the most important thing that there is. Do note that the total mobilization does have a side effect of reducing the percentage of a population that can be recruited in the army because you have so many people working in the factories for you, you can't have as big of a military, but that's okay. Um, most likely the war economy is pretty damn good. Reduce those consumer goods and let you build things even faster. It's wonderful. So there's all kinds of great laws like that. Every time you get enough political power to uh, change one of your laws or hire one of your dudes over here, you will get a little pop-up reminding you of that. So we can just ignore it for now. That's wonderful. Um, so now what do you do? Well, you wait, really. 
When does World War II break out? Well, that's one of the lovely things about being in Germany here, is that you get to choose when that happens. How do you do that? Well, there's two ways to start fighting. First of all, it's worth noting that if you were to right-click on any country in the game, you would open their diplomacy view. Very handy. That includes you, although your own diplomacy, well, you can't really do diplomacy with yourself, although you can get this nice little details panel. But if you were to right-click on Poland, for example, and go back to the diplomacy tab, there are some actions that we can take over here. Um, <coughs> two of them that are very interesting are boost party popularity and stage a coup. World War II basically involved three major sides. The democratic nations, the fascist nations, and the communist nations. Boost party popularity, boost the popularity of your own party. And in this case, for example, as Germany, we can boost the uh, support for fascism in a target country. Um, what do you do with that? Well, you've got this little panel here that shows you how a country feels about different things. So Poland, for example, is about 18% democratic, it's about 2% communist, and about 15% fascist, and 65% non-aligned. If we boost party popularity, we'll increase the support for fascism. What can happen with that? Well, sometimes you get an election. Some countries do have elections from time to time. I hear, for example, in France, the next election is in 1936. And if there's a large support for a particular party, then a different government might get elected. Right now, French, France is democratic, but they might become communist, for example. Another alternative is that if the support for another party gets high enough, there might be a rebellion. There could be a... Um, a referendum, there could be all kinds of different things that result in the country changing hands. There might even be a civil war. I'm looking at you, Spain. You can also force the issue if you want by staging a coup. Staging a coup takes a lot of political power and requires that you send a lot of guns to that country. But you can cause a country to raise a popular coup in one of the government types that is not currently in power. So one of the things you can do is you can influence a nation uh, to follow your party, and then once the popularity of your party gets high enough, you can then stage a coup, because there's gonna be enough people who believe that your government is the best no matter what. Are we gonna do that with Poland? No, that, that, there wouldn't be any point. We can just conquer Poland. Well, let's go and declare war in Poland. Oh, we can't declare war in Poland. Why is that? Well, here you can't just declare war if you don't have an excuse. Those excuses can be extremely flimsy but you need an excuse in some fashion, which is why there's this justify war goal button here. Now, you do need a little bit of political power to do that. How much power and whether you can do that depends very much on what kind of government you have. If you are a democratic nation, you can't really go around justifying wars. Your own people won't support it. But if you're fascist, they're super for it. And if you're communist, they're still pretty for it. And things will change as world tension increases. This little world over here at the 0%, this shows you how crazy people are getting. As more tension rises, as people justify wars, as people take certain decisions in their national focuses, as wars actually break out, world tension will rise. And as the world tension rises, a lot of rules continually change. Eventually, even the, the democratic nations can decide to get involved in warfare. But right now, their people really, really, really want to pretend there's never going to be another war ever, ever, ever. Clearly, that's not going to happen. So, if we saved up enough political power, we could start justifying a war goal against Poland, and then once that completes, we could declare war. Is that what you want to do with Poland? Not really. Why is that? Well, as Germany, if you look at your national ideas over here, and you go down the branch that happens that starts from the Rhineland, if you remember your history class, at some point, you're going to get something called Danzig or war. Although it depends on what, what branch you go through exactly. This is basically, you're telling Poland, they have to give you a certain amount of territory, or you declare war. Now, whether or not they say yes will depend partially on whether you hit a historical AI when you created the game. Um, historical AI determines if countries follow their national focuses historically, and also whether or not they say yes or no to certain ultimatums in a historical fashion. But regardless of the case, Poland may or may not say yes or to giving you this territory, or they may say no, in which case you'll instantly be in a war with them. And that's Usually, it's a historical way that you would go to war over there. That's not the only way to do it. Um, and in terms of the Netherlands and Belgium and Luxembourg and France, then, you know, you could maybe decide to just justify a war over there. Although France will probably um, guarantee the independence of Poland. So when you declare war on Poland, France and the UK will have both their guarantees trigger. And then you will find yourself in a world war all of a sudden. Hey, that's fantastic. Hey, what do you do with all these units? 
what, okay, I guess, yeah, we'll probably need some military units to fight a war at some point. That's that's kind of cool, I guess. So let's take a look at our little exclave over here. We've got a little pocket of land, and we've got some units. You can box select them. Notice if I box select over here, it doesn't actually select the ships. If you do want to force the ship selection, which you can just click on, you can also just hold control, and if you hold control while you box select, it will select the ships. Notice that if I select the ships, the map changed a little bit. That's because there's three major map modes down here in the bottom right corner. There's the default map mode, which is mostly the land combat map mode, hence the little dude here. There's the naval or the strategic navy map mode, which is how you move your boats primarily. And then there's the strategic air map mode, which is how you move airplanes. We're going to ignore the airplanes for now. So we got our dudes over here, and uh, well, you should know how to do this. I mean, God, you you clearly watched the uh, you played the the Italy tutorial, right? So you know you can select all these people, then you can hit the plus button to add them to an army, and then once you have an army, you can create front lines with this button and by clicking on a border of a country. Not only that, but you can also set offensive lines like this, so you can say right click and drag an offensive line, and then what will happen when you unpause the game? These troops over here will go ahead and deploy themselves automatically to the front line and then push forward. You can, of course, manage troops yourself by simply selecting a unit and then right clicking somewhere. That is a perfectly fine way to move things around. However, it's impractical to move everyone that way unless you play this, the game at speed one or you constantly pause and unpause nonstop. Most of the time, you're going to be very, very happy to just grab a bunch of units like this, add them as part of an army, add them as part of a front line, click offensive line, and then drag out somewhere to make them do things. Where should your lines be drawn? I don't know. I'm not your mother. You figure it out yourself. You know, click, figure out what you want to conquer. One thing to note when you're invading a country, places with stars or capitals and places with squares are important cities that are worth victory points. A country capitulates when you get enough victory points. But again, you should know this because you played the tutorial as Italy and have conquered Ethiopia. <sighs> Let's talk about something that's not really talked about in the tutorial, and that is how to organize your, your divisions over here. These divisions get made at the start of the game. Which divisions are here depend partially on what nation you're playing, um, and also more divisions might get created for you as you um, unlock different types of units. For example, once you if you haven't started with Alpine divisions and you've researched them, then you'll get an Alpine division built up for you. Same thing with Marines and Paratroopers. But you can make your own. In particular, it's going to be very important for you to edit these as the game goes on. Let's take a look at our infantry division. Instead of hitting train, we're going to hit edit over here to, d to edit the division template. So this is our infantry division. It encompasses, uh, if you're playing Germany, 12 infantry brigades plus a engineer company and a support artillery company over here. What does this all mean? Well, all of your divisions are made by a certain number of brigades. And what's interesting is they can be different strength. For example, if I go and start removing dudes over here, this is still a division. Except whereas we started with 12 brigades of infantry in this division, now we only have three. This is a division that is one third as strong as the previous one. Is there a reason to do that? Well, sometimes, because you can only move single divisions on the map, if you're having to occupy, I'm just gonna reset over here and just close this temporarily. If you're having to occupy a very large area, but you don't need very strong troops to do so, you might be tempted to make a very lightweight infantry division. Now, you're still gonna need strong infantry divisions, but you might need both. So in this edit screen, one of the things you can do is hit this duplicate button. If you hit duplicate, you can design a new division. So for example, we're going to call this the uh, lightweight, lightweight garrison type division, which is something that I like to do quite often. And that can be something I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, war is hell. Um, that can be something that is considerably more lightweight and is well suited to guarding a very, very, very large area that doesn't need a significant amount of troops. For example, in Africa, for example, because this is an incredibly vast area, but because of the geography, because of the poor infrastructure, because of the fact that it's desert, you don't tend to need a very concentrated force there. And so it's a good candidate for making these sort of colonial garrison divisions, for example. Um, the same thing happens if you watch my, my Brazilian campaign. I end up very, they very light tr weight troops on my coast over here, just so that there's token resistance to an, in, uh, an amphibious assault. Um, so they can't just like waltz into the country, but it doesn't use too many people. It doesn't use too many people, doesn't use too many resources, and it's very easy to have a very thin but broad defense. So that's that. How do you design these divisions? Well, the most important thing early on is probably just look at this thing called combat width. 
Combat width tells you how much of a front line is occupied by this troop. This is very important because all combats have a limited front line. What is the combat width of any given combat? Well, it's gonna depend on a lot of different factors. For the sake of simplicity, you can probably assume that the front line is probably gonna be about 80. 80 combat width is the maximum number of people who can fight simultaneously. And in this infantry division would count up as 18. Now, again, the actual combat width in total doesn't necessarily matter, but what matters is the fact that it will almost always be a multiple of 20. As a result, you tend to want to uh, design your divisions to have a combat width of 20 so that you can pack them in appropriately. Imagine, now you can see here, for example, if a combat has a total width of 80, you can fit four divisions with a width of 20. You can also only fit four divisions with a width of 18, right? Because 18 times four is equal to some number, because math is hard, 172, I want to say? Or, sorry, 72? Um, but what's important to note is that in that case, you're sort of wasting four combat width where there's not going to be any units. So try to, to design your divisions to have a combat width of 20, unless they're supposed to be a super lightweight unit. But even then, maybe you can make it, I don't know, a 10 or something like that. Because again, things tend to be a multiple of 20, and so if you can, divide, if you can design your, your divisions to be something like that, that works out well. I suppose you could make your some of your divisions um, 40, but, you know, that that's, wow, those are some pretty heavy-duty divisions. Anyway... How does this work? Every single one of these battalions has a combat width of two. So if we wanted this to come out to 20, we could add another infantry division over here. Note, it does take experience points to be able to redesign design your divisions. Your experience points are listed over here. You gain experience points mostly by fighting. However, one of the, one of the first things you might wanna do as most nations, although not literally the first, generally speaking, but something you tend to do fairly early is to hire a theorist. Every single one of these theorists will generate some experience points for you. What kind of experience points depends on who you hire. So for example, this is an army experience gainer, that is to say land units, as opposed to this character over here who gives you air experience or this character who gives you naval experience. It's quite common, I would say, probably to get someone who gives you more army experience. This person just passively every day generates a certain amount of experience for you. Again, fighting will give you experience, but another way to get experience is to exercise your troops. Over here, one of the armies that we created earlier, there is a button over here to exercise. If you do this, you will gain experience points. Well, first of all, your units will gain individual experience points and potentially rank up. This is particularly important for new units that start off as green. Green units have a penalty to everything they do, minus 25%, it's pretty significant. If they train past green and become regulars, then they no longer have a, pe a penalty, or sorry, um, not regulars, regulars level three. I don't know what the level two one is, the normal ones are of level two, get no penalty whatsoever. These are level threes, which are regulars, and actually have a plus 25% bonus. Regulars is as high as you can get through exercise, but even if they have maxed out their rank, then you can still exercise them to earn army experience sort of globally as a nation, which is what one of the things you can use to redesign your divisions. Experience points is also used to upgrade your, your tanks and other type of units, but we're gonna ignore that for now. So anyway, you can go and simply add more units over here. So I could add an extra infantry battalion, which would bring my combat width up to 20. You can see the number increase over here. You can see some other stats improve all over the place. More people equals more HP and organization and attacks and all kinds of things. Okay, that all sounds good. Red numbers technically are bad, although increasing your combat width is, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to it, but 20 is sort of a sweet spot over here. What do all these numbers mean? Well. Again, mostly more stuff is more better. Attack is pretty explanatory. I told you soft attack is for killing squishy people like humans. Hard attack is for killing tough stuff like tanks. Uh, breakthrough is a bonus to how much you can attack with, basically. It gives you some extra staying power there. Defense is the same thing on the defense. Defense and breakthrough are basically the same thing, but one is better for attacking, one is better for defending. HP, if you run out of HP, you will be dead, gone, completely. However, every combat, even if it doesn't generate a, or bring a division's hit points to zero, tends to kill some of your people, but they come back from manpower. Organization is the morale of a unit. When a, or, when a morale loses, when a unit loses all their organization, they are forced to retreat, and this is by far more common. It is extremely rare for a division to be wiped out completely unless it's encircled. It's much more common for a unit to run out of organization and have to fall back one province. 
defense. One of the things infantry does well is have a fair amount of organization as compared to tank divisions. Tank divisions tend to have far fewer organization. In fact, if you mouse over any given thing, you can see light tanks actually decrease the organization of a division. Tanks do not have a huge amount of staying power. You need infantry to upgrade your organization to last longer. On the other hand, tanks have incredible amount of attack and significant breakthrough. You can see that even with only combat width of 12, this division is not very strong, right? Combat width of 12, clearly it could be almost twice as big for those really optimal numbers, but it already has a breakthrough of 187 versus the infantry's breakthrough of 34. Tanks are really good at attacking. Infantry's really good at defending. But if you made a division that was only tanks, they would have no organization. They'd fight for about three seconds and then immediately be forced to retreat. And if they happen to be caught in an awkward situation, they may not be able to retreat safely, in which case they would simply surrender. Tanks can't operate on their own, which is why this Panzer Division here has four battalions of light tanks and two battalions of motorized infantry. Motorized infantry are infantry, therefore they increase your organization. You can see these are adding plus 4.7 organization as opposed to the tanks, which decrease your organization by 1.5. So these are boosting your organization. Motorized infantry are more expensive and require more equipment than regular infantry or leg infantry, but they move they move faster, which is important because the whole reason that you would build a division of light tanks is because, well, yes, they have good breakthrough, but they're also really stonking fast. And so it would be unfortunate to pair these with leg infantry. For the sake of argument, if we did go ahead and add a regular infantry battalion over here, what would happen to our speed? It would drop to four kilometers an hour. That's because walking infantry is very, very, very slow. And a division moves at the rate of its slowest member. In fact, you could slow it down even more if we were to add artillery. Um, apparently I'm lying to you. I thought towed artillery was slower than uh, regular infantry, but I guess not. Towed artillery does a lot of damage, but they are slow. Later on, you're gonna be able to generate self-propelled artillery. That is to say, artillery that is basically on a tank. You can actually see that if you go to the research screen and you go to armor, you can see, for example, our Panzer II over here. It's got these little buttons over here. This is to generate, this generates an entirely new unit, but based on the Panzer II tank um, chassis. It doesn't eliminate your Panzer II. Your regular Panzer II tanks will still be in the list. But right over here, the Vespa, Wespy, I, I don't know, German is weird. This is a self-propelled artillery and it will hit just as good as artillery, but move just as fast as a Panzer II. So it's actually quite a cool little thing to research. If you do click on these things, you will get some stats over here. For example, you can see that this German self-propelled artillery, maximum speed 12 kilometers per hour. So that would allow you to add infantry, or sorry, add artillery to your Panzer divisions, which increases its damage hugely without sacrificing speed. And that sounds something that's pretty nice. All right, that's it. That's it. We're gonna stop there. This is our tutorial. You've got a little bit of extra background. Play that damn Italy tutorial. You're gonna be fine. People keep asking me for this, but the Italy tutorial is really good. This is probably the Paradox game with the single best tutorial ever. Um, you can watch my Let's Plays, which give you a lot of information. I don't know. This is me. This is my angry tutorial. People keep asking me for a tutorial and it seems crazy. If you play the Italy tutorial and you watch my Let's Plays, I... I I, th I think that's pretty much it. Hopefully you'll watch maybe at least the Brazil one, which is my latest one, at which point I actually know a little bit how to play. Um, at the time of me writing, um, uh, making this video, the Brazil one is my absolute newest one, but who knows, there might be even more recent ones. Do check my channel, and you should probably just start from the latest one. All of my tutorials are, or all of my Let's Plays are semi-tutorial style, so it should teach you a fair amount about how to play the game. But uh, yeah, that's it. Hope you enjoyed my angry tutorial Go out, play some Hearts of Iron 4, conquer the world. Um, Germany, I think, is an excellent start for that because you really get to set the pace, and it's easy to manage, just such a, a limited amount of space over here, as opposed to the UK, which has things all over. France, same thing. Soviet Union only has places, only has territory in one contiguous chunk, but it is huge. It's fun to play, though. Nothing wrong with the Soviet Union, but it is huge, and that can lead to some interesting problems. Uh, I, I do recommend playing one of the major nations. I mean, I, I know when I started playing Hearts of Iron 4, or Hearts of Iron one actually i thought that playing one of the bigger nations would be more difficult it turns out it's not really it's actually it tends to be a lot more fun and you really do get to set the pace and some of them are very 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 straightforward especially if you know anything about world war ii and you can sort of follow that general plan especially if historical ai is turned on um 
it's not that hard to follow. And as I always say, if you play as Germany and lose, that's okay, because it turns out this guy's a giant ass, and we want him to lose World War II. So, good job! See you next time, folks.